I'm going to give you a brief overview of the Snowflake architecture and what makes it different to other cloud data platforms on the market today. If you stay watching until the end of the video, I'll be giving you some specific links to help continue your knowledge around Snowflake. Don't forget, if you like this video, please like and subscribe and leave some comments below. And don't forget to press the bell for more content like this coming soon. So in the past, historically storage was tightly coupled. You couldn't have one without the other. At the start of a project, you had to predict the size of your server and project the future demand on your servers for the next two to three years before putting in your order, paying your money up front and crossing your fingers, nothing changed in the meanwhile. This led to over or under provision and resources. Both are bad and ideally you'd want to try to avoid either. Many companies have spiky workloads with the need to scale up their compute resources instantly to cater for short bursts of high demand. For example, the retail sector will typically anticipate spikes in traffic for Black Friday sales. Reality TV shows regularly have short windows of time for live voting. These companies need to ensure they have huge amounts of resources on standby, ready to cater for the demand. And thankfully, with the advent of cloud computing, storage is relatively cheap in comparison to compute. One of the key differentiators of Snowflake is decoupling of this storage and commute. This provides the ability to independently scale either storage or compute demand depending on your specific needs. This design allows you to run multiple workloads on the same set of data without any resource contention. Snowflake's architecture can be broken down into three specific areas. Database storage. Snowflake reorganizes structured and unstructured data into its internally optimized, compressed columnar format. Query processing. Snowflake uses compute and memory resource provided by virtual warehouses to execute and process queries and data operations. And cloud services. A collection of support and services which coordinates activities across the platform from users logging in to query optimization. And here's a diagram of the free tier architecture in Snowflake. A useful analogy is to think of this as a postal service. The database storage is the mailroom, designed to efficiently organize and store all the different letters and parcels arriving from many different places. Some parcels are very large, some small, while others are just regular letters, but they almost find their place in the mailroom. Query processing acts as the courier. It handles the logistics of taking the mail from the sender and working out the quickest and most efficient route to deliver it. Once delivered, it could then obtain a response and return it to the sender. The virtual warehouse provides the resources to allow these deliveries to take place. Sometimes all that might be required is a bicycle, other times a van or truck. In specific cases, a plane might be required for international items. And this can be linked to the size and the different sizes and number of clusters within a virtual warehouse. Sometimes you may just need a small, single cluster warehouse, and other times you may need a heavy duty, extra large version. Those addresses which regularly keep a lot, a lot of post are kept in easy access for fast retrieval. This is known as the cache. And finally, the cloud services layer is the headquarters or the big boss. It's the end-to-end -end tracking system providing oversight across all the services. It ensures the post is secured for access when in transit and keeps the lights on to ensure the post reaches its destination within the guaranteed timescale. It's really helpful if you can keep this metaphor in mind as we look at each of these services in detail within the following slides. Understanding how these features complement each other really helps when thinking about how to design efficient solutions on Snowflake. With thousands upon thousands of letters and parcels coming into the mailroom each day, you'll need a system to store and organize them. Without a process to help find a specific item of post, you'll struggle to locate what you need and very quickly the whole system will be in complete disarray. This is exactly where the first layer of storage architecture comes into play, the storage layer. Organizing and tracking where data is stored for efficient retrieval. Data is stored in micro partitions, which are small blocks of storage. 
ranging between 50 megabytes and 500 megabytes in size. These blocks are on the underlying cloud provider's data store, whether that be Amazon's S3, Google's cloud store storage buckets, or Azure blob storage. Essentially, Snowflake treats each micro partition as a unit of DML. Using this approach simplifies a lot of internal operations within the system. As data lands into Snowflake, a few key things happen which are completely transparent to the user. It is these operations which create the solid foundation, which in turn enables lightning fast query performance. You can break these operations down roughly as follows. When data is loaded into Snowflake, the first thing that happens is it's divided and mapped the incoming data into micro partitions using the order of the data as it's inserted or loaded. Secondly, the data is compressed into Snowflake's native format. And finally, metadata is captured and stored for future reference within, within Snowflake. What are the benefits of micro partitions? Well, given the small size of the partitions for very large tables, we could be talking millions of these micro partitions. However, this granularity brings additional flexibility, allowing for finer grain query pruning. And let me give you an example. So imagine you have a transactional table with 10 years of sales history, but you only want to look at yesterday's sales. I'm sure you can imagine the huge benefit of targeting just the data you need, rather than scanning the entire table to return such a small proportion of the available data. And that's what happens with micro partitions. The metadata associated with them allow Snowflake to optimize the most expensive area of data processing, the IO operations, which is effectively reading and writing to storage. This allows Snowflake to take the query and target just the data it needs to read to satisfy the query. When you've written some code you need to execute, or you're ready to load data, then you'll need to associate this query with a warehouse so you can execute it. The size of the virtual warehouse directly correlates to the number of credits required to run the warehouse. After the first minute, which you're always billed for, credits are then calculated on a per second basis while the virtual warehouse is running. It is recommended you start with the smallest virtual warehouse size first and experiment with different workloads and virtual warehouse sizes until you find the best balance between performance and cost. Essentially, a virtual warehouse is a bundle of compute resources and memory. You need a virtual warehouse to perform pretty much any DDL or DML activity on the data within Snowflake, and this includes loading data into tables. Going back to our postal service analogy, the cache is for those places which frequently receive a large amount of the same type of delivery. Because we know what this looks like and how to deliver it, we create a special section for it in the mailroom to promote efficiency. When Snowflake receives the same query again, it can rapidly return the results set to the user without needing to go and find the data from the storage location. Cloud services. This collection of services ties everything we've discussed so far together. It's the head office of our postal service, the brains of the operation, and it covers the following, authentication, so this manages the service which allows users and applications to log on to the Snowflake platform. Infrastructure management. This aspect looks up the management of the underlying cloud infrastructure, including storage buckets, provisioning and decommissioning new clusters to support virtual warehouses. Metadata management. This service collects metadata when various operations are carried out on the Snowflake platform, and it helps answer the following questions. Which users are using what data? Which users are logged in? When was the table last loaded and is it being used? Which columns are the most important in a table and which columns are the least used? And then we've got query parse and execution. So this service works out the most efficient way to process queries. It parses the query to ensure there are no errors and manages the query execution. And finally, access control. This service ensures that users can only access or carry out operations on the objects or data they are permitted to use based upon their privileges. So in summary then, in this chapter, we covered Snowflake's three layer architecture, 
we looked at how the database storage layer effectively stores both rel relational and semi-structured data in small blocks of storage called micropartitions. We learned how Snowflake stores data whilst collecting metadata to support fast and efficient retrieval. We gained an understanding of how to work with virtual warehouses within the query processing layer. And finally, we discussed various components which make up the cloud services layer, which ties all the services together, providing a seamless service to end users. Early on, I promise there'll be some extra resources I can point you towards. First one is if you're looking to be certified in Snowflake, there's the Snow Pro course certification exam. I have a Udemy course. The link is in the comments below. And this contains over 120 practice questions that will help prepare you for the exam. You can also follow and connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, where I regularly post content I hope you find valuable. And finally, you can like and subscribe to this YouTube channel for, for the extra content that I'm going to be producing over the next few months. Please leave a comment below if you found, found this video useful and like and subscribe for similar content in the future. And finally, I'm midway through writing a book and publishing a book on Snowflake. It's called Bill and Solutions of Snowflake, and that'll be out in the coming months. And anyway, well, thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you again soon.